Yes, Oscar. Yes, yes. Amen, amen, and amen. We were just talking about how that was another one of the favorite songs of the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King. If I can help somebody as I travel on, then my living shall not be in vain. Welcome everyone to this worship service, January 17th, the year 2021. Here on the weekend where we are remembering the life and acting in service to commemorate the life of the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. We are glad to be here and we are glad to worship today. I will let you know today that on Friday night I preached at the Sabbath service for Lab Shul and we had quite a time, quite a time. And today Rabbi Amakai Lalavi will be our guest preacher, because we do a preacher swap. And this is our fourth year, I believe it is, our fourth year in a row where we're doing a preacher swap. So I'm looking forward to hearing the word that he has to bring to us today. So as we worship today, let us hear now our Psalm of the morning, Psalm 139, verses 1 through 18. Psalm 139, verses 1 through 18. Please read along with me, if you will, if you so choose. O oh Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know when I sit up and sit down and when I rise up. You discern my thoughts from far away. You search out my path and my lying down. Acquainted with all my ways. Even before a word is on my tongue, O oh Lord, you know it completely. You hem me in behind and before and lay your hand upon me. Hmm. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is so high that I cannot attain it. Where can I go from your spirit? Or where can I flee from your very presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and settle at the farthest limits of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me and your right hand shall hold me fast. If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me and the light around me become night, even the darkness is not night to you. The night is as bright as day and the darkness is as light to you. For it was you, it was you who formed my inward parts. You knit me together in my mother's womb. 
and I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. And wonderful are your works that I know very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was being made in secret, intricately woven in the depths of the earth. Your eyes beheld my unformed substance. In your book was written all the days that were formed for me, when none of them as yet existed. How weighty to me are your thoughts, O God, and how vast is the sum of them. I try to count them. They are more than the sand. I come to the end. I am still with you. I would now like to welcome and thank at the same time, a thankful welcome to our ruling elder, Andrea Bradford, who will serve as leaders for today. Ruling elder Bradford. And good morning, everyone. Wow, what a what an introduction to this amazing service that we that has been developed and discerned for our hearing. I bring you greetings from Huntsville, Alabama, where the sky is a clear blue and it's uh, about 45 degrees or so, but lots of sky, which is always nice. I'm so glad to be here with each of you, all of you, worshiping our God together. So let us continue our service with our call to worship that we will read responsively, responsively. <laughs> <laughs> and responsibly. <laughs> All right, so our call to worship. Beloved, we are gathered today as community, a vision of the beloved community. A community where redemption, reconciliation, and love weave us together as a tapestry. We strive to reflect creation's design for the dream of humanity. Let us lift up our voices and sing the songs on the holy mount of Zion. Let us see one another at our best. Let us teach one another our deep lessons of faith. And let this communion of praise and prayer be the fuel that leads us into the world, bringing holy justice, righteous peace, and grace-filled agitation to decry oppression. For marching in the light of God is the hope that keeps the dreams alive. Our opening hymn is a hymn by that unknown Swedish composer Carl Gustav Boberg and rewritten by Stuart Klein. So let us sing How Great Thou Art. <laughs> And for its 
thou art. We are in such adoration and we move now to our prayers and begin with our prayer of adoration. We are so blessed. We are so privileged to, to have this opportunity of prayer together. There are a lot of people in the world who don't have that privilege, so we do not take it lightly and we offer these prayers with that understanding and that gratitude. Our prayer of adoration says, the confidence that God is mindful of the individual is of tremendous value in dealing with the disease of fear. For it gives us a sense of worth, of belonging and at homeness in the universe. Reverend Dr. King's words let us know that we are not inconsequential specks on this bold and beautiful planet. It allows us to know that we each carry a brilliant piece of the divine given to us on the day of our creation. It is intentional that we are connected, connected to this will well of sacredness and connected to each other as fellow leaders teachers and guides along the way. Mm. Oh, the profound design that simply and boldly says, we matter. Adonai, we lift our eyes to the hills in gratitude and adoration for thinking about us, for loving us, and always making sure we are in sight of the will of the divine. Yeah. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> Let us now sing this song, knowing in full assurance that what we ask for in this song is available to us. Yeah. 
This day and every day. And so we have our call to confession. We have just talked about how we love the Lord so much. And we know that we continue to be all that God wants us to be. Sometimes we fall short, but we continue to walk hand in hand with our God. And we confess that we sometimes do not come to where we know God wants us to be. Our call to confession says, why do we confess when we come together? Dr. King seems to call us to understand that there is comfort in a higher good in our imperfections. He says, in this world, there is one whose matchless strength is a fit contrast to the sordid weakness of humanity. Together, let us humbly recognize this weakness, saying our prayer of confession together. We are but humans struggling to rise above the rubble in the aftermath. In our fear and anger, our human desire is to protect our own by any means, take back our rights by any means, to prove we are right by any means. We recognize that we often pay lip service to nonviolence. We see it as a strategy and forget that it is a holy change agent found in all of our sacred writings. Help us to live into your revelation to the prophet Martin Luther King Jr. that the aftermath of our commitment to nonviolence is the beloved community we seek. May this good will be on earth as it is in heaven. Amen and amen. You are now invited to bring your silent confessions to the divine.
and indeed this is well known one of the favorite songs of the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King. <clears throat> I don't know why I'm so emotional today, but amen.
Amen. Amen. We are so blessed to be in the hands of our God. And God says, yes, I am with you. I forgive your confession. I know you love me and we will walk together. Our assurance of pardon as we strive to live as the beloved community, rest assured that we are already beloved, blessed, and dressed to be the change we want to see in the world today through grace and mercy. Rest assured that grace and mercy reside in your neighbor and your friends as we learn a new way together. Remember, we are the ones we've been waiting for. Be to God. Amen. 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 Let us sing together, not only to God, but to one another as we move about in this world. Lead me, guide me, because we need one another as much as we need God at times. <laughs> I am weak and I need thy strength and the power to help me over my weakest hour. Lead me through the darkness thy face to see. Oh, lead me, oh Lord, lead me.
just lead me. Oh, Lord, lead me. And one more time we say, lead me, oh, and guide me along the way. For if you lead me, I cannot stray. Oh, Lord, let me walk each day. everyone. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God. I'm so glad I have this box of tissues here. I don't know why I was a crying mess during those songs. They just really hit me. I just thank God for spirit and for all of you being here today. Welcome again to St. James Presbyterian Church. And I thank you for worshiping with us on this morning. All 70 of you that are here online and those of you who are out there in the Facebook world, Thank you for taking the opportunity to worship with St. James today. Here in the corner of 141st and St. Nicholas Avenue here in New York City in the village of Harlem. We do have just a few announcements for the good of the cause. I need to bring something up because I forgot to print something out, but that's okay because we have technology right here with us and we're gonna make it work for us. And the reason why I wanted to pull up this document is I, I do have slides for our notices and announcements, but I always make up a bulletin itself for our worship service. Um, and one of the things that I love to put in there is my mom saying for me to you, and I'd like to share that with you, but I put something in today that I didn't want to forget. And it says, I must remind you that a starving child is violence. Neglecting school children is violence. Punishing a mother and her family is violence. Discrimination against a working man is violence. Ghetto housing is violence. Ignoring medical need is violence. Contempt for poverty is violence. And lest we forget the power of being in union with a partner for so many years. Those are the words of Coretta Scott King, a stalwart in the civil rights movement, all of her own accord, walking side by side with her husband, not, be not, be not behind but side by side. And I wanted to share that with you today. So again, now I can open up that slide to share with you a little bit of our other information that I wanted to share with you today. So, unfortunately, we will not have Bible study tomorrow night. We will not hold Bible study tomorrow night. So if there's someone who's not on the email list that you know who calls in, give them a call and let them know that we will not be meeting tomorrow night. Um, the lectionary texts for next Sunday, however, are um, Jonah from Jonah 3, 1 through 5 or 1 through 10, Psalm 65, 1 through 12, 2 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 7, 29 through 31, and the Gospel of Mark, chapter 1, verses 14 through 20. And the reason we're not having Bible study tomorrow night is because everyone is invited to attend a Presbyterian service of worship in celebration of the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and Rosa Parks. This will take place online. Um, and if you would like more information regarding the Zoom link, please email me at pastor141 um, at Saint, pastor141 at verizon.net and I'll get you the information because it's a little complicated for me to read it to you now um, here online. But if you have a pencil and a piece of paper or a pen and a piece of paper and you'd like to write down the calling number I can and the passcode, I can give you that. 
So uh, the call-in number for this worship service is 929-205-6099. That's 929-205-6099. The meeting ID, which you will need if you're calling in, is 880-7656-8798. Once again, that meeting ID is 880-7656-8796. And unlike this service where we have someone letting you in bit by bit, there's a passcode for this worship service and you punch that into your phone as well. And that passcode is 209-366, 209-366. So that is on behalf of the Presbytery of, Saint, of uh, New York City, they will be having this worship service as they do every year um, at some time. But this one is being mostly sponsored by the, by the uh, New York chapter of the National Black Caucus of Presbyterians. So um, we ask that you sort of National, National Black Presbyterian Caucus and NBPC. So we ask that you support this fledgling effort of the rejuvenation of our um, National, National Black Presbyterian Caucus here in New York City, which was defunct for a few years after the passing and the illness of uh, Mr. Washington. But now it's up and running again. So we invite you and encourage you to support them in any way that you can. So there's that information. Also, our wonderful friend, Rabbi Amakai, who is standing by with us today, um, and I will be doing our first session of From Separation to Reparation uh, 2021. This is a, a reboot of the eight-week um, eight week, uh, workshop that we did during the High Holy Days and I told you so much about, but this will be a monthly conversation from, Jan from June 2021, um, from January 2021 to June 2021, a monthly conversation series on civic and spiritual resistance to racism. So we invite you to this. Um, we're on a journey committed to solidarity and systemic change. And the online sessions will be focusing on the legacy of Howard Thurman who many of you know is a leading theologian, civil rights activist and author, and also a self-proclaimed mystic. As we deepen our understanding of history and reality, private response and public responsibility. Each monthly session will be followed by optional peer-to-peer -peer learning sessions. This is an online course um, and there is a sliding scale from zero all the way to however much you would like to give. And um, we're gonna be doing this, as we say, for the next six months. And we're gonna close the doors probably after the first or, first or second session. But so you're more than welcome to join in. And once again, please send me information or send me an email at pastor141 at verizon.net if you would like to join. And I'll just send you out this information so that if you're sitting at home and you're tired of writing, you wanna get back to worship, you can do that. And I also want to just give you our information for your visual because we have people that learn in many different ways or people that learn from hearing people that learn from writing down people that learn from being able to see it so we want to sort of accommodate as many learning styles as we possibly can here and so there is the e there is my email pastor141 at verizon.net if you need a visual cue it's pastor and we're at 141st street verizon.net and the church's email is St. James 409, our address number, at verizon.net. So there's our information, and there's our website, stjamesharlemnyc.org. stjamesharlemnyc.org. Pretty self-explanatory, right? Because there are so many other St. Jameses throughout the country, so we wanted to be special. All right, now I would like to invite um, a ruling elder, Dr. Jacinth Hansen, to tell us and give us some announcements and to give our love back to First Presbyterian Church of Newtown. 
Thank you, Reverend Derek. Good morning, St. James. Good morning, Newtown. Good morning, Lab Show. These are the announcements for Newtown. We thank you for your giving in 2020, and we ask that you continue to give in 2021. You may mail in your offerings and tithes, or you may go to our website, fpcn.org, and donate online. As we approach the final steps and calling an interim minister, we ask for your prayers. The interim search committee has presented a candidate to the session, and they're putting together a package for the Commission on Ministry of the Presbytery to seek its approval. We remind everyone, if you know of people who are not in touch with us, who are not receiving our emails, to let Bobson know so he can add them to the mailing list. We ask you to continue to reach out to your family and your friends in the congregation. So this week, call someone or text someone or email someone or even send a note by United States Postal Service. <laughs> and as we celebrate MLK weekend, let us remember that injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. Amen. Have an excellent week. We love you. We love you back. So thanks so much for that. And I'm going to take the spotlight off and then we'll move forward as well. What's next in our bulletin? What does it say? Oh, it's your favorite part, ruling elder Andrea Bradford. <laughs> peace, 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 peace. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> My favorite part. And so we uh, we get a chance to share a little love with one another with this these introductory words to prepare the disciples for their own ministries, Jesus gave them peace so that his teachings would rest on the fertile ground of their hearts. May this peace of Christ be with you all. And also with you. Share some love. Unmute yourself and peace to everyone. Shalom. Peace to everyone. Peace everyone. Peace, everyone. Peace, everyone. Good morning. God bless all. Good morning, everyone. 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 Good morning. Hi, Love Show. Hi, Love Show. Yes, welcome, Love Show. Welcome, Love Show. Good morning, everybody. Good morning, Good morning Gloria. Good morning, Phyllis. <laughs> I'm going to start muting pop folks. Hi, Rita. Hi. Hi, Rita from Gloria. Hi, Gloria. Good morning. 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 All right, folks, I'm going to mute everybody. Uh, Pastor, if you could then uh, unmute yourself. Yes, sir. <laughs> well, thank you so much for that. That brought me so much joy. And I think it brought some joy to my friend, Rabbi uh, Amakai, because I saw him there just sort of grinning and rocking in his chair. I really loved that. <laughs> I believe that he really enjoyed that. So I'm very happy about this. Um, actually, what I would like to do is I'm, I'm going to sort of embarrass him just a little bit. Um, Rabbi Amakai Laulavi comes from a long standing, if you remember, generations and generations and generations of rabbis. Um, his call story is very much like many of our call stories. We are told that, you know, you need to follow through in this line and we do our best and our best and our darndest. 
and running away and doing other things and finding other things that bring our life completeness and to, that brings our life some joy and some fun, some radical fun, some radical protesting, radical ways of, of exerting our independence and who we are and our identity. But that tap on the shoulder brought him back. <laughs> and I'm glad that it brought him back when it did because apparently the universe meant for our spirits, our kindred spirits to come together so that we could worship together through the arts, through ritual, and through a loving, loving, loving dedication to the texts, um, which we share. Um, it's been such an incredible learning experience. And whenever he introduces me, he always says, and now I'd like to introduce to you my friend and my mentor and my teacher. Well, I say the same thing today. Everyone today, I formally introduce you to my friend, my mentor, and my teacher, Rabbi Emekai Lalabi of Lab Shul, and that wonderful community that grows with us and works with us and will be doing more with us as we move forward um, in the years to come. So that's, in spite of usually having a resume that you would read in the bulletin, that's what I wanna say about Rabbi Amakai Lalavi. So we look forward to hearing you, Rabbi. If you would like to unmute yourself just to say hello for just a moment or two, feel free to do so. Derek, it's not fair that you have the box of tissues and I don't. That's all <laughs> I'm gonna say. I'll do my best. I'm sure you will, my friend. Good morning, my dear, dear brother and teacher and mentor and friend. It is such an honor to be with you and with these beautiful, beloved communities together as one. I'm so, so moved and so honored. Thank you. You're welcome. And I just did the, did the honors myself, instead of Chris doing it, of clicking in. And um, your mother is joining us today. So I'm very, I would like to welcome her <laughs> as well. Um, it's such a joy. I've heard so much about you and learned so much about you. And I'm so grateful that you're with us today. Um, and everyone else who is a part of Lab Shul that is with us today. Ruling Elder Bradford. Yes, sir. It's, uh, I, it's, this is wonderful. That, <laughs> that's all I can say to start. It's, um, it's, it's heartwarming. It's inspiring. Uh, and I have my box of Kleenexes here as well. So um, we are we are all in good company. And being touched is a good thing. Um, There's so few things that are touching us in the positive these days that being able to smile and be touched and have a few tears is a is a positive thing. So as we move on in our service, we now move into the hearing and the reading of the word. And I look so forward to hearing you, Rabbi Amakai, and what you will have to say to us and for us today. But first, we're going to hear a little bit from the scriptures. Our prayer of illumination leads us into that reading. It says, Holy Spirit, enable us to discern how we are called to answer to the teachings of these words. And Holy Spirit, inspire us to then say, here I am. Our first reading is from 1 Samuel, the third chapter, verses 1 through 20. 1 Samuel 3, 1 through 20. Now the boy Samuel was ministering to the Lord under Eli. The word of the Lord was rare in those days. Visions were not widespread. At that time, Eli, whose eyesight had begun to grow dim so that he could not see, was lying down in his room. The lamp of God had not yet gone out. And Samuel was lying down in the temple of the Lord where the ark of God was. Then the Lord called, Samuel, Samuel. And he said, here I am, and ran to Eli and said, here I am, for you called me. But he said, I did not call, lie down again. Mm -hmm. So he went and lay down. 
the Lord called again, Samuel. Samuel got up and went to Eli and said, here I am, for you called me. But he said, I did not call my son. Lie down again. Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord, and the word of the Lord had not yet been revealed to him. The Lord called Samuel again, a third time. And he got up and went to Eli and said, here I am, for you called me. Then Eli perceived that the Lord was calling the boy. Therefore, Eli said to Samuel, go lie down. And if he calls you, you shall say, speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. So Samuel went and lay down in his place. Now the Lord came and stood there, calling as before, Samuel, Samuel. And Samuel said, speak, for your servant is listening. Then the Lord said to Samuel, see, I am about to do something in Israel that will make both ears of anyone who hears of it tingle. On that day, I will fulfill against Eli all that I have spoken concerning his house from beginning to end. For I have told him that I am about to punish his house forever for the iniquity that he knew because his sons were blaspheming God and he did not restrain them. Therefore, I swear to the house of Eli that the iniquity of Eli's house shall not be expiated by sacrifice or offering forever. Samuel lay there until morning. Then he opened the doors of the house of the Lord. Samuel was afraid to tell the vision to Eli. But Eli called Samuel and said, Samuel, my son. He said, here am I. Eli said, what was it that he told you? Do not hide it from me. May God do so to you and more also if you hide anything from me of all that he told you. So Samuel told him everything and hid nothing from him. Then he said, it is the Lord. Let him do what seems good to him. As Samuel grew up, the Lord was with him and let none of his words fall to the ground. And all Israel from Dan to Beersheba knew that Samuel was a trustworthy prophet of the Lord. And from 1 Corinthians, the sixth chapter, Verses 12 through 20. First Corinthians 6, 12 through 20. All things are lawful for me, but not all things are beneficial. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be dominated by anything. Food is meant for the stomach and the stomach for food. And God will destroy both one and the other. The body is meant not for fornication, but for the Lord and the Lord for the body. And God raised the Lord and will also raise us by his power. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Should I therefore take the members of Christ and make them members of a prostitute? Never. Do you not know that whoever is united to a prostitute becomes one body with her? For it is said, the two shall be one flesh. But anyone united to the Lord becomes one spirit with him. Shun fornication. Every sin that a person commits is outside the body, but the fornication sins against the body itself. Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, which you have from God and that you are not your own? For you were bought with a price. 
Therefore, glorify God in your body. And our gospel reading from John, the first chapter, verses 43 through 51. John 1, 43 through 51. If it is your tradition to stand during the reading of the gospel, please do so now. John 1. The next day, Jesus decided to go to Galilee. He found Philip and said to him, follow me. Now, Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip found Nathanael and said to him, we have found him about whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus, son of Joseph from Nazareth. Nathanael said to him, can anything good come out of Nazareth? Philip said to him, come and see. When Jesus saw Nathanael coming toward him, he said to him and said of him, here is truly an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. Nathanael asked him, where did you get to know me? Jesus answered, I saw you under the fig tree before Philip called you. Nathanael replied, Rabbi, you are the son of God. You are the king of Israel. Jesus answered, do you believe because I told you that I saw you under the fig tree? You will see greater things than these. And he said to him, very truly, I tell you, you will see heaven opened and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. All right, so do we have any, I know we have some young people that are out there, and I'm just going to speak with you for a few moments before we bring in our friend Rabbi Amakai, and it says, let the children come. And remembering that this is an invitation for all of our youth for and a quote from Tony Morrison's beloved. That's what this section is named after. And I want to talk to you about this whole idea that it, it's your call. It's your call. It's not mama, daddy's call. It's your call. It's your call. And what I mean by that, many times when we hear call, as you heard me speak about with Rabbi Amakai, our call stories that we read about that are so holy about how God is calling us. But I want you to understand something about our young man, Samuel. And this happens with so many people, with so many of us. Samuel, his mother, she was so worried that she couldn't have children and she prayed and prayed and prayed to God. And all of a sudden she was blessed. Even, the, pro, even the, the priest of the temple thought when she was praying that she was drunk. She was like, no, I just want to have a baby. And God said, oh, okay. The priest said, okay, you're going to have a baby. So she had this beautiful little baby boy named Samuel. But she didn't keep him. She said, because God has been good to me, I'm going to give this baby to the temple. So this little boy, Samuel, has spent the entire time of his life in the temple with this guy, Eli, right? This other priest that we just read about. So can you imagine, just imagine being your age and having to run around and be the caretaker of a temple for a priest. That's what his life was like. But here's the thing that gets me about Samuel. His mother knew in her heart of hearts that there was a special place for him. And we all feel that way about every single one of you. But it's your call in terms of how you respond and when you respond. That's what we do when we do our confirmation classes. You know, many young people 
automatically people assume that when you join the church, that when your parents join the church, that you join the church. Well, a confirmation class is all about confirming whether or not this is truly where you feel that you are called to be. So Samuel needed an opportunity to say, wait a minute, okay, I'm here, but what does, is it really my call or is it my mom's call? And in this particular text is the moment when Samuel recognizes this is my call. It's not what anybody else thought it was going to be, but this is mine. And he goes on to do great things. And you know, there was another man who we're celebrating today whose father did something that not many people know about. And Martin Luther King Jr., Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. was born in 1929, January 15th. His father went to Germany in 1934 with a bunch of ministers, and they made a huge statement about racial inequality and racism as Nazism was blowing up in Germany. It was starting to get really big. If you remember Jesse Owens, when he won the gold medal at the Olympics, Hitler refused to stand for a black man. Well, Martin Luther King's father, Martin Luther King Sr., he went to Germany, made the statement and toured around Germany. But his name wasn't Martin back then. His father's name wasn't Martin. His father's name was Michael. Michael King and Michael King Jr. The Reverend Dr. King's name was Michael. But his father, when he toured Germany, he went and toured the church where Martin Luther, who hundreds and hundreds of years before stood up to the Catholic church and said, what's right is right, found 95 things wrong and nailed it to the door of the church. And it left Martin Luther King's father wondering, what would it be like if we had someone who stuck to their truth in a world that we live in today. So when he got back home, he changed his name and he changed his son's name. Now, growing up, sure, Martin probably heard this story over and over because you know how people tell the same stories at Thanksgiving and Christmas and they talk about when you were born and those important moments in your life. You're like, okay, I've heard it, I've heard it, I heard it. But it wasn't until most likely, he was asked to lead the civil rights movement just as another young preacher, because nobody else wanted to touch it, that he finally understood that there was a purpose and a call on his life. It wasn't his father's call. It wasn't just being named after a major reformer of religion but it became his. Now I say that today to say, it's your call. When you know that you have a purpose and a claim on your life, own it. Own it and do your best with what it is that you have and that you have been given. I see glimpses of it in each of you. We all do, but I can tell you what I think is gonna happen with you when you grow up, but it won't matter. But what will matter is that we will be here for you, for you to tell us what you found that your purpose is. So now we pray for that. We pray that like Martin and like Samuel, that the change in the in the and in the, the influence that people have on you in your when you're young, that it will blossom into greatness. Because it, greatness is within every single one of you. Most gracious and holy and loving God, we say thank you. We say thank you for the call that you you lay upon our lives when you knit us together in our mother's womb, as the psalm said. It's our destiny to have a purpose and to have a, 
something that we can claim of our own in our lives. And we thank you for that. Even if we don't know what it is, we still thank you. Because when we are in thanksgiving, we know that when the revelation comes, that we will be in the right place at the right time to make just the amount of difference in our lives that we're supposed to. So give us the anticipation of the joy of that moment of saying, it's my call and I'm claiming it now. These things we pray in the name of all that is holy. Amen and amen. I am made new. 
can burn me, no battle can turn me, no mountain can stop me, cause you hold my hand, now I'm walking in your victory, cause your power is within me, no giant can defeat me. Brothers and sisters, I now bring you Rabbi Amakai Lalavi. Good morning, my friends. Today, the family and friends from all over the world, it is such a deep, profound honor to be with you today. And I'm so deeply moved. And indeed, I wish I had Reverend Derek's box of tissues <laughs> right with me right now. I'll do my best without it. It's really incredible to see all of our communities together. This is beloved community, and it is years in the making, and it is years more to go as we get beyond all the divides to build this one place of being. Thank you for this warm welcome on this and every day. You know, sharing words of faith or wisdom on any given day is a daunting task. How much more so on this day when we're honoring the life and legacy of Dr. King? How much more so at this moment in history, just days after our nation has witnessed one of the darkest days in our history? Days before the anticipation of a new chapter in our nation's history with so much excited expectation. I wish we could just be so happy today for this inauguration this coming week with this chapter that so many of us have worked for and now working for. And yet we know that with all the joy of getting a reliable and decent and kind new leader, and an incredible new vice president, our first woman and woman of color along with him, with all this excitement, there is a great deal of anxiety and concern. And that's real. We are in the midst of one of the most concerning and complicated moments, the biggest crises this nation has known of division 
and discord. When in the middle of one of the most terrifying medical crises our species has known. Instead of coming together to battle the virus, we're seeing more fighting than ever over masks and vaccination, over the very nature of what is truth. What is love? And so the question is, how did we get here? And maybe a more important question is, how do we get out of here? That this spirit we are feeling here in this Zoom room this morning of faith and love and camaraderie, that is what we want and believe in. All of us, all of us. How do we get there? So I want to share two stories with you today and a thought and a hope that these inspirational narratives will give us some tools, some guidance, some inspiration to lift our head high, to lean in deeper into the truth we know we are the heirs of, and to give us the courage and the compassion to speak truth to power, but begin with ourselves. I'm hopeful today, and like many of you, concerned. And so it is to the past that I go in order to be more present and look forward to the future. I want to start with one of these two stories. September 20th, 1958, in Harlem, not so far from the beloved St. James Church that I look forward to as we all do, Reverend Derek, to be with you in person there again. On that day, 29-year-old Martin Luther King Jr., and I'm so grateful to know the origin of his name, Reverend Derek. Wow, we'll come back to that. On that day, he was at a department store in Harlem signing copies of his new book called Stride Towards Freedom, The Montgomery Story. A long line of people. One of them was a woman by the name of Isola Curry, an African-American woman who would later be fortunately um, identified as schizophrenic. She lurched towards King with a letter opener and stabbed him in the chest. Motives unclear. King was rushed to the hospital, Harlem Hospital, in critical condition. The doctors told him, had you sneezed, you would have died. Mm -hmm. But he survived. And there in the hospital, he received a visit from one of his mentors, one of our teachers. Howard Thurman was one of King's mentors. He was about 30 years older. He was a colleague of King's father, whom we heard of earlier today. At the time, he was the Dean of Marsh Chapel in Boston University, and that's where he knew King from. Thurman, as you heard Reverend Derek talk about briefly today, was an impressive an important character in American and religious and African-American history. He was a philosopher and a theologian, a mystic, a civil rights leader, an author, a man of faith and vision. In the 1930s, he traveled to India to meet with Gandhi. And there he really understood the merit of nonviolence and the importance of the spirit to the work of civic change. He came back and he taught that gospel. A lot of the non-resistance work that we are familiar with that King and others took came because of Thurman. And we are eternally grateful to him for that. This will be some of what Reverend Derek and I will be teaching in this course we're starting this Thursday. Thurman and King did not meet often, but that hospital meeting was pivotal. What we know from it, that Thurman told King to rest. Mm -hmm. He said to him, your body needs healing. Your soul needs healing. Take two weeks off from your sacred work. Find time to meditate, to pray, to ask yourself about your life's purpose, to reconnect to your source. If you don't recharge inside, you will be useless outside. Thurman said to him, and King as we are told, at first resisted. There's so much work to be done. Thurman said, listen to me, go in, and then you'll be able to go out. In a letter that King wrote 
to serve in. Several weeks later, he said, I'm following your advice on this question. We know the rest. King briefly rested, deeply moved by the tradition of spirit he had inherited, that the work he did to give us the dream that we are still trying to achieve, and a decade after that first assassination attempt, there was one that so tragically succeeded. What I find so compelling about the story of Thurman and King is the story of mentorship. Mm -hmm. The wisdom of the elder leader who knew how to coach the younger leader, not just on the public work, but on the private work, on what does it mean to spiritually, soulfully connect to self. What does it mean to go inside before you go outside? This would be Thurman's life's work. And in so many ways, King's legacy to us, for all, all the ways we've been involved in Black Lives Matter and in social change demands these last years, especially this last year, it is so incredible to see that taking a moment to breathe, taking a moment to pray is part of the struggle. It is not marginal, but the work of spirit is critical to the work of social civic change. But I think there's much more that needs to be done in this department. As we fight racism, as we fight oppression and all the systemic ways in which we get to be marginalized and victimized, hand in hand with a call of justice is a call of spirit, the inner life. This is the why and how of the work towards repair. Thurman taught King that in so many deep ways as we are taught today. Now look, I'm preaching to the choir, right? We are in a church here with members of congregations, Jewish, Christian, other perhaps, preaching about the importance of religious practice and religious lives to the activation of social change. But what I think is important for all of us as perhaps our teachers and leaders have learned in the past that religion can be the tool for change, but it can also be the tool of oppression. Religion can be the virus and it can be the vaccination. It can be the virus because the religion that many of us have inherited is full of grace, but it's also full of, I'm better than you. I grew up in a loving Judaism where nevertheless, men count more than women and straight count more than gay and humans count more than animals. And in some contexts, white count more than colored. That's what we inherited, but that's what we're here to fix. Like Martin Luther King Sr. understood, like the original Martin Luther understood, like Jesus understood, like so many Jewish, Christian, Muslim, other leaders understood and understand, but we still have to work on. Because last week in the Capitol, there were people there standing in the name of religion. And they stormed that room that says, in God we trust there. And we know how much abuse in the name of God we have seen over the centuries. So yes, the spiritual religious path can be the vaccination, but it can also be the virus. And so it's on to us to understand deep inside how we will appreciate the inner life our inner life to find the discord so we can fix. Understand how we are part of the problem, but we can be part of the solution. We must, because there are files in our hard drive that must be eradicated. There's work that we must do as a collective, a global collective, but it's got to start inside. We got to overcome by first going inside. Here's a second story we already heard today to illustrate this point that I'm trying to get to. The importance of the inner life, as we heard beautifully from Reverend Derek, articulating the story of Eli and Samuel, 
And thank you, Andrea, for reading it so beautifully as you always do with the scriptures come alive. So in this story that I haven't heard in so long and was so delighted to prepare for today, we are rewinding thousands of years ago. We are in the land of Israel, the place called Shiloh, Shiloh, a name holy to this congregation and to the African-American Christian community. Shiloh was the tabernacle where the Hebrew people, our ancestors worshiped. And there was an old priest there, his name was Eli, Eli, and his sons. And they were a corrupt religious structure. I'm exactly clear why, but there was a problem there with that religious leadership. And that young boy, Shmuel, Samuel, who was given to God through his mother's prayers, is there in service. And as the word of, uh, of the story begins, the boy Samuel was ministering to God under Eli. The word of God was rare in those days. Visions were not widespread. It's an interesting beginning of the story. There was a moment where there was a disconnect between the vision of the divine and what people were saying. Religion was there, but was it serving the need? Young boy Shmuel, Samuel is sleeping at the foot of the holy ark. And the old man is sleeping in the back. And three times the young boy hears the voice. Shmuel. Thinks it's the old priest once and twice. Then the old man mentors him as Thurman mentored King and says, listen to the call. You are being called, boy. All you have to say is, here I am, I'm listening. Inani, here I am. And what young Samuel hears is devastating. He hears that the religious establishment that he's serving, this old man who just counseled him, is part of the problem. It's part of the paradigm that must shift. What is this young boy to do about that? How do you address the fact that the religion you are serving and were born into is problematic? What call do you hear inside to become who you need to become as a change maker, as a change agent? In Samuel's case, a great prophet, a king maker, a very complex character, which we won't get into right now. The thing is, Samuel paid attention because he had a mentor like King. And because he listened to the inner call, not just the outer call, he went inside beyond language, beyond words like Lord or Adonai, between, beyond the religion that he inherited with all of its beauty and faults. He went inside to hear the inner call that is beyond language. As we are all invited, instructed, always and right now to do. Eli, like Thurman, was a spiritual mentor. The critical role of mentors in our lives to give us the information, the invitation to go inside and hear the inner call. That sometimes is very dramatic and calls on us to truly question what we inherited, what is the past, so that we can reimagine the present and chart a new future. Why does the inner life matter so much? We heard the words of Dr. King earlier today. This is the way to step forward. But I want to suggest that what really happens when we go inside, when we hear the inner call as King did, when he learned his father's teaching, but went deeper inside as Samuel did, as so many did. Once we go really, really inside, we understand that underneath all the differences, white and black, Jewish and Christian, gay and straight, woman and man, other, there is really one, that we are deeply interconnected, that we are singly living as an ecosystem, all living beings on this planet and maybe others. And therefore we have the moral responsibility for each other to transcend the differences that we've been taught that only happens when you go deeply inside to understand that we are deeply connected as one. We say these words a thousand times, 
but they're often just words. They will only be activated towards understanding and action if we do the work of going inside, hearing the inner call, practicing, cleaning the debris of thousands of generations of fear and hostility and walls and fences to find that which connects us within, which in some ways is what's happening here today on this Zoom call, which is nothing less than a miracle of gratitude, but only the beginning of our work. Only introspection, introspection will bring us to realize that we are truly one and that what we have to do is work tirelessly to never forget that we are loved as one and that we must love as one, including those whom we can't stand. And that's hard. The hatred that we witnessed last week in the sacred chamber of our democracy, on the streets and on the screens of the world, is one that comes from the forgetfulness that we are truly one and responsible for each other, from the lies that some religious paths have spread, that some are better than others, and others are threats to who we are. Those are lies, political lies, religious lies, fearful lies. And we are here to uncover the truth, that truly we are one in the multiplicity of many. We know this. How do we internalize and actualize this? Alice Walker, one of our greatest teachers, artists and prophets said, the most common way people give up their power is by thinking they don't have any. Well, we have power to witness the color purple and to notice, to go inside and to remember there can be no civic change if we don't change within. To remember truly that we are members of one family, truly responsible for each other beyond the so-called differences of the pigments of our skin or the nature of our gender or who we love or who we voted for. That is not the point. And I know I'm preaching to the choir, but I think we need to remember this again and again and again. I know I do. Because the fear of other, the division towards other keeps coming up. The judgment that is fear-based, only with a deep, deep inner work that gatherings such as these can help us get beyond. Today, on the world calendar is something called World Religion Day. It was created by the Baha'i movement, an interesting ecumenical movement that really believes that we are all one. And many houses of worship all over the world are marking this weekend and this day as World Religion Day that believes what we're saying right now. That underneath all the differences, religion could be the virus, but it can and must be the vaccine for human suffering that we are really one and we can fix the toxic past that we inherited, the words of faith that both unite and disconnect us and go deeper and higher to achieve the goals that Dr. King believed in and Thurman and in his way, Eli and the paradigm of religion that was replaced by Samuel and the countless prophets all the way to Alice Walker, all the way to our heroes and heroines walking the earth right now to remind us that underneath all this discord, all this hatred that got us to this moment, there is the possibility of paradigm shift, of a spiritual, civic, courageous, compassionate reality that we know we know and in so many ways we have forgotten. I hope today we don't. We got here through hate, but we will get through this through love. 
We got here through fear. We will come out of this through courage and patience and trust and the inner work we must each do to discover that call inside that calls us as that voice called Samuel and King and each one of us by name to believe that we are loved, all of us, and we have purpose to add more love to the world. The Beatles were right. All you need is love. And then hard work to go inside and to take it to the public sphere. We have a big week ahead. May this week bring more love than violence. May this week bring hope and joy. May this week bring healing and health all over the world. May we see the light within and beyond as this tunnel becomes a bridge and this bridge becomes a ballroom and this ballroom becomes an ocean of joy. Yes, there is much to be anxious about, but let's take a moment now to breathe in appreciation of this gift of life that we are sharing with each other right now. Please take a deep breath with me. Thank you. Thank you for welcoming me again and again to share words and to build community together, to build beloved community together to my friend and mentor my teacher, Reverend Derek, blessings and gratitude for your leadership, friendship, and courage. To my friends from Lab Shul and St. James, to friends I'm seeing here from all over the world, may we together find the ways to go inside, to recognize where the virus is and our own vaccinations so we can become the change agents we want to be in the world the prophets, the artists, the lovers, united by our love of life. Thank you, friends, for this invitation. As we say in Hebrew, Shavuot Tov, good week. May we enjoy, appreciate, and rise. And may America this week rise, rise, rise. Amen. Amen. As everyone is saying in the chat, thank you for touching words. Thank you, Rabbi. Great message. Amen. Thank you, Rabbi. We are all together here now, and we are being prayed with from Israel through, through all of us for all of what comes through. So we give thanks. And we ask that when we do this work and we go inside and when we are rejuvenated, that we don't rely on our own sensibilities to try and get it done, that we work with one another and that we do not be afraid to say, guide my feet while I run this race. Oh. 
Oscar for that. May it be so. May it be so. And now is that time when we come together and we pray. And I ask that you would simply put yourself in a position of meditative prayer or meditation and to just discern what is on your heart. And as we are in this prayerful space, lift that up. Just lift up what is on your heart, what you care about, what you would like to know, what you would like to, for the universe to reveal to you so that we can make a difference and do what it is that we are called to do. This is our time when we get to rest and lift up what is on our hearts so that we can find some rejuvenation as well. Most gracious and loving creator, we come to this place today. We have joy and exhilaration from being the beloved community as we aspire to be all that that really intones. But we also know that right now we have worry on our hearts. We are of troubled mind and troubled spirit for all that is going on around us. As much as we try to stand, as much as we try to run this race, we see that down the track that there are impediments and we don't want to slow down, but we have to figure out how we're going to go over or go around. But we don't ask for you to move these impediments at all. We just ask you to give us the strength and the wisdom to figure out how to make it. Mahalia Jackson and other singers saying, Lord, don't move this mountain, but give me the strength to climb it. And that is what we're asking for today. We don't need all of this moved out of the way. We just need the strength to go through it and to move up it and around it. When Martin Luther King speaks of going to the mountaintop, it is not an easy journey, but it is worthwhile. Don't move the mountain, just give us the strength to climb it so that we will not have fear, so that we will not be daunted by what naysayers do, by what people do, by insurrectionists and what they do, by what terrorists do. We don't have to give in to that fear because we know that we have been to the mountaintop and when we go there, we can see the promised land. So no one can touch the promises that are made for us. No matter what fires are set on this earth, no matter who decides that they want to try and change the course of the multitude's choice for history's direction, 
we know that on the mountaintop that the land that is promised for us is for us help us to figure out how we can make that happen how we can release the fear how we can release the anger how we can release the emotion that holds us stuck and paralyzed and stuck in place so that we do not know how to act let us just know that by loving we are acting let us just know that even if we decide that we need to take a break and to heal for a week or two that all we have to do is heal with love in our heart with grace in our hand and mercy for ourselves oh god oh god make us aware that we can have mercy on ourselves and give us the space to be able to process what is going on in this world let us not be ashamed to take the time because when we take the time we actually sit in the realm of the spirit and the spirit is what speaks to us, what guides us, what leads us, what moves us on to make a difference in this world. We do not have to give in or give up. We ask this so fervently because, because we, as we are sitting here being the proverbial choir that is being preached to, we know that the choir needs a sermon too, oh God. We know that the choir also needs the strength and the power because they, we need to lift up our voices. We need to lift every voice and sing as we go out into the world so that they will know that, that we are love, that we are trying to do what is righteous, that we are trying to embrace justice and truth and honor and to lift up the dignity of all people on this earth. But we can't do it if our lights are dim, if our voices are tired. So let us rest to be able to do so. So that when we do see those persons who have been behind bars and who have given up their lives because of the system has told them that they are not human beings, that we can tell you, yes, you are. You are a human being because you are breathing and you are being human. Let us be able to speak to those mothers who are incarcerated and to their children to make sure that that love bond transcends the walls, transcends the barbed wire, transcends the handcuffs. Let us be the ones so that when we walk into a hospital room, whether you are calling someone home to another realm or whether we will just bless the memory of them the next day, that we will know that when we walk into that room, that that person will feel the Spirit's love and know that no matter how it comes out and how it works out, that your living has not been in vain. And if it is your will for more living to be done, then let us remember when we step up out of our hospital beds that we have been called to pick up the cause again and to testify that we are here for a reason and for a purpose. And as we have mercy for ourselves in this time of discernment and in this the great, great opportunity of the word, of what the word Sabbath really means. Oh, allow us, just allow us to be filled with overwhelming capacity for love, with overwhelming tears of joy, not tears of sorrow and hurt and pain and anger and fear, but tears that knows that within our spirits, we are aligned with what is good. Lift the burden of the anger and the hurt and the, the fear away from us so that we can know that it is good. It is good. Be with us and keep us. Love us and hold us. Let us be with one another and keep one another. Let us love and hold one another. We are each other's mentors. We are our brothers and our sisters keepers. Joyfully let us hold on to this certainty 
that we are the beloved community. We can be love as our community. We pray this in the name of all, all that is holy, right, and good. Ashe, amen, and amen. Just a little bit more, everyone. We're going to take that time in the service to do our virtual offering. But as I say about virtual worship, there's nothing virtual about it because when we are in the one spirit with one another, we are together. So I lift up these offering plates to let you know that all that you give goes towards the ministry of our communities to go out into the world. Today, there are three communities here with us that we know of. First Presbyterian Church in Newtown. You heard that they have a giving portal online. You also know that you can mail your offerings to any one of us. Lab Shul, you can go online and make sure that you give to them as well. And here at St. James Presbyterian Church, you can go to our website and give on our PayPal portal. But as Dr. Hansen said, when she talked about the offerings from, from Newtown, we do accept things from the U.S. Postal Service as well. But this offering goes so that we can bear witness to all that we are called to do to allow us to have the strength to come together and refurbish and refurnish our energies to go out into the world. May these offerings that we are claiming today, may they be a blessing unto all of those who are touched by the intent and by the offering of the ministries of all of these communities. Be with us and keep us and be with us as our gifts of time, talent, and treasure. As you promised, will be multiplied. We don't pay, we don't pay you for blessings, but we do give because you have given so much to us. Amen. Amen. have our closing hymn which I will put the words up on the screen and it is a song that we are lobbying from what I understand to be the national hymn and it is traditional for African Americans because we do consider this our national anthem for all of us to stand and sing lift every voice <coughs> and sing.
don't need the road we trod, mid of the chastening rod, felt in the days when hope unborn had died, yet with a steady beat, had not our weary feet come to the place for which our people sighed. For we have come over a way that with tears has been watered. We have come treading our path in the blood of the slaughtered. Out from the gloomy past till now we stand where the bright gleam of our bright star is cast. God of our weary years, God of our silent tears, Thou who has brought us thus far on the way, Thou who has found So my friends, you have heard from the good rabbi. You have heard from your songwriters. You have heard from the liturgical prayers. Let this be a balm for your spirit. May it help you discern in which directions you heed your call. May we be in this call together side by side. We have been blessed by the legacy of the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. His words, his actions, what he stands for, his philosophies, his theologies, they are ours, our gift on this day. This is your blessing, your benediction. Embrace them not just the I have a dream speech. Read his words. Read the words of his wife. Find out what songs inspired him like climb every mountain. And when you do this, I urge you to speak his words out loud. Don't just read them on the page because I believe that Dr. King wanted everyone to know that the lofty words that he spoke belong in the mouths of all of us. So go take this message to the world. Be blessed. Be kept. Be held. And be loved. This your gift to the world. Let the church say amen. Let the church say amen. God has spoken. So let the church say
Let the whole church 